I'm going to talk about the zero cost cloud. Um, you know, not really totally zero cost, but you don't have to put any money down to get it. Um, right, you know, no cash. We're going to talk about open source. Um, we've been doing quite a bit at Cable Labs on, you know, how can we improve interoperability? How can we, you know, make it easy to do a POC? How can we increase collaboration? You know, one of the challenges to doing collaboration is having everyone working together on the same platform. And that's one of the reasons why we're really keen on open source. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, where we're at in the life cycle. You know, everybody's like, great, you guys have NFE, it works. Let's deploy it and we're done. Well, you know, we're not there yet. So we're kind of at what I'm calling the lift and shift phase. I totally stole that from someone else. Um, but, you know, the VNFs look a lot like physical devices. They behave like physical devices. You need to deploy them, you know, active standby or active active. They don't necessarily scale horizontally. They require a VM. You have to do a lot of things with the networking where you make it look like a physical network with either using VLAN isolation or SROV and you bypass the entire virtualization layer. And you know, the monolithic VNFs. And it takes you know, about nine months to onboard one because you have to do customization. You have to customize it to your OSS BSS system. You have to customize the VNF to the application. And even if a vendor's done that once, to do it for a different provider with the same software stack, they still have to go back and redo a lot of that. Um, which kind of takes us to the next phase, which we see about you know, one to three year time frame. Hope I'm not overly optimistic. Um, you know, we're looking at that to be you know, much more smaller, you know, cloud native, you guys are probably sick of that term. But basically, you know, disaggregated VNFs. So as opposed to having a firewall, you know, some of the firewall rules like layer one through three or four will be actually done on your switch with OpenFlow or P4 or somewhere else in the network. Um, we'll be using containers more for the software space. Um, and it'll still you know, have some customization needed. You know, we'll see the evolution of standards, um, the verification and certification programs with OPNFE and ONAP um, will be coming out and should have you know, a little more value as we get some traction with running those. And then, you know, really longer term, right? We want to get this, you know, autonomous self-healing network, network automation, and actually getting closer to zero touch, right? You have a robot ship your CPE to a customer and their robot plugs it in. Um, you know, just kind of getting there, you know, really having everything disaggregated. This is where we get to the excellent service um, using things like um, machine learning, closed loop automation for self-healing networks, self-optimizing networks. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. I think we've kind of beat this horse to death. You know, why are we doing it? What are we doing? You know, we need to get cost out of the system. We need to increase capacity. You know, everyone sees 10x data growth in the next, you know, one, two, 10 years and kind of continuing on be that beyond that. And we're not going to get there with the traditional ASIC model. Um, this is the slide I'm excited, I got permission to share. So a lot, some of the, most of the stuff on the slide actually isn't published yet. We'll, we'll be seeing it come out, but you know, one of the things is, that is published is from SNL Kang is that once you get beyond 96 DOCSIS channels is where you actually see a much lower cost solution for the virtual CCAP. Um, this is, you know, looking at TCO and capitalization. Um, the other three numbers here, um, we actually got from CASA Systems, and they did that with a specific service provider. So these are all based on one use case um, with the node plus zero architecture, if you're familiar with that, and that's where basically we have a remote PHY device serving a few homes close to the edge. So the PHY layer is no longer in the head end, which is you know, central office for all the telco folks. Um, so we're actually able to virtualize that. And we're able to get basically over 10x the performance, the data throughput with, in less space, not in more space. You know, if we weren't virtualizing it, it wouldn't actually fit in the building. And instead we're getting you know, over 10x growth while you know, taking out some, a rack or two of servers. And that's with two use servers. You know, we're still seeing increased density and we'll get this better over time. But I just kind of want to pause there because that was like you know, one of these cool numbers we've been talking about. We'll save money, we'll save money. Well, where are you going to save money? Well, you're not going to have to build more buildings. That's an easy number to, to capture. Um, so let me kind of switch back to you know, what are we doing at Cable Labs? 
You know, we've really been trying to build this foundation and drive interoperability. Um, you know, looking at across a range of access networks, you know, we have Remote Fi is the technology that we're rolling out now. We're working on some additional standards for Remote Mac Fi, which actually puts the Mac layer out into the access network. Wi-Fi and several of our members are doing things with LTE and 5G. And we're really looking at, you know, how can we actually have a converged solution for all of this? And then to do that, you know, looking at some of the hardware, really commodity hardware, white box switches, accelerators where we need them. But the ideal is, you know, every server is the same in the head end. I, I think we'll probably have two or three types personally, but we're trying to drive that. Like that's our pie in the sky goal. Um, and then, you know, it's talking about open collaboration and how do we get to this zero touch cloud. We have some open source projects out here. So we have Snaps Boot, and this just kind of installs Linux on your server. I'll go through it in a little more detail, but just does it in a quick, easy way. There are a hundred other tools to do it. Um, this was just kind of a fairly quick and dirty way to do it. Um, then we have Snaps OpenStack, which is going to wrap around the upstream OpenStack. Um, today we're based on the Pike release, um, which was the previous stable release. In March, um, the Queen's release came out from OpenStack, and we see about two months um, need for it to stabilize, so we're actually starting to kick the tires with Queen's and should have a release out in a month or so that supports Queen's. Um, we're, we're our, so, you know, everybody's here in containers. We're kicking the tires with Kubernetes. We will probably release some open source. You know, we're just using KubeSpray right now for those that are familiar with it, and it's much easier to install than OpenStack, so. It's kind of nice. And then serverless, again, is another paradigm. You know, instead of having containers, you just have your code out there, and it runs on demand, and the system takes care of scheduling it and load balancing it. Above that, we have um, Snapso, which is actually part of OPNFE, and that's actually the foundation for a lot of the tools. It's almost like an automation script that's being used by a lot of the test tools for the compliance and verification program for OPNFE and ONAP. So we're really trying to drive the interoperability and the testing and verification through that method. And then we have an automation repo posted publicly. It's just kind of some random scripts we do, some examples. It's just, you know, a good place to go because, you know, if something we're doing isn't proprietary or something we can share now, why not post it? Um, we use Apache 2 licenses for everything. Um, again, go a little more detail. Um, these are some of the main services for OpenStack that we have running. You know, obviously compute and networking and um, storage. We do have you know, block storage and object storage. You know, block storage is one of those things where it's you know, good for some of the data stores and databases, but we'd really rather see the VNFs get away from using block storage and use actually a higher level storage, you know, like a database as a service, and really separate the compute um, from the persistent data. Um, we have Tacker. We've used that some for doing some orchestration. It's a Tosca-based orchestrator in OpenStack. Um, Slometer provides um, metrics back and fault data, and we use that. Um, and then Magnum, which actually gives us Kubernetes and other containers on top of OpenStack. Um, the other Kubernetes we're doing is actually just looking at Kubernetes bare metal. So we can kind of you know, layer things however you want. Um, so you know, what are we doing? We're trying to hit the easy button. Sorry, <laughs> resist. Um, so this is kind of you know, going down into a bit of the details about what does Snaps Boot do? You know, why, why is it beneficial? So everything you do is, you know, for our model, we have a build server, and this can be a VM um, that connects to all the servers we'll be installing. And all of our interaction, everything that we load or whenever you log in, you only have to log into the boot server. And so from there, you know, we set up, you, know, you download Snaps Boot from GitHub, we have a config file that has information about your network and about your servers. And then we use IPMI over LAN to, or no, then we set up some services locally, kind of steps one through four. You only have to do that once. And then you can redeploy as many times as you want with number five. So we really probably need a wash, rinse, repeat cycle there on number five. And yeah, we set up DHCP and NTP and some core services to get the install going. And we just automatically, you know, do IPMI over LAN, reboot the server, do a Pixie install, um, set up some network configuration stuff. Again, that's one of those things that it seems basic, but when you're setting up the network across multiple NICs on multiple networks with certain isolation and stuff, 
it takes some time. So it's nice to have this in this repeatable manner. So next is you know, same workflow. You know, kind of we have our pattern, and we're sticking with it for Snaps OpenStack, which is going to download Snaps OpenStack, um, you customize the configuration files, and then you start the deployment. And the deployment actually, you know, even though we're launching it from the build server on the controller, it actually goes and pulls down code um, from a version of what's upstream in OpenStack. So we have Cola Ansible. If you guys are familiar with Cola, it's a container-based OpenStack. And we use that because it's much more repeatable for the install process, allows us to checkpoint um, more of the system, and provides for a much faster install. And they have some Ansible scripts, which is the most mature way to do the deployment. And you know, basically download the containers, install them, configure them. Um, you know, the kind of the downloading and installing the containers, that's all managed by, by Cola Ansible. We just do you know, edit the 50 config files you need to edit to get that working. Not that many, but there are quite a few. And then we set up, again, additional network configuration because when you finish a Cola, install by default. You still have to go in and tweak the network for your configuration. And all this generally follows the network model and design from OPNFV and the Pharaohs project, if you're familiar with that. And again, you can kind of just repeat this process anytime you want. We have cleanup scripts, so once you get Linux installed, once you get OPNFV installed, you can run it. They're like, oh, I want to do a different version, or oops, I got in there and I was messing with vSwitch and I host the system. Fine, you just do you know, clean and then redeploy, um, and you get it. It takes about 30 minutes to just do a redeploy with the containers. Um, so our typical environment um, is the same size as the Pharos pod, so we have five servers. Um, we're currently doing one controller and four compute. Um, we will be adding some HA for the controller, but really since we're targeting lab environments, we don't need HA for what we're doing. We'll just redeploy if it goes down. But yeah, great question. So summary, right? We think open source is good. We think standards are good. We want them to play together. Um, try to leave it two minutes for questions. Um, do try snaps. I'd love to see you know everyone here who has a couple servers go down and download it. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, these slides are posted. So you just use snaps boot, snaps open stack. Um, we have listed there and on a blog site that I have a link to on the next page, how to act, contact us, you know, email snaps at Cable Labs, or we have a snaps um, IRC channel as well. Um, so we're happy to help and um, actually have got this running on some vendor, some hardware vendors that have an open hardware platform. And they got it fairly quickly, a little bit of a challenge because they had slightly different hardware, but they said it went much easier than a lot of the commercial distributions they've done in the past. And there's a couple links, so. So yeah, so we have two minutes, maybe some questions. Yeah, more than yeah. two minutes, because you have oh. 20 minutes. Oh, I had 20, oh, I was just looking at the timer down here. Uh, I thought I was really, yes. I was wondering. No, I mean, all right, so. Okay, well, we'll catch this up. All right, Dan. All right, right, uh, Dan Pitmeff. Say a little bit about where the Curio Lab fits into all this. That's, Great question. I was almost trying to decide if I wanted to do a Curio thing, but Robin presented yesterday, so I didn't want to overlap too much. So the Curio Lab actually you know, runs, snaps OpenStack for a lot of our workloads to do interoperability testing. So the Curio Lab, so here's my snaps lab, here's the Curio Lab, you know, and adjacent racks. And so the Curio Lab is really there for um, one-off vendor engagement. Um, we've done, the, so actually a lot of the CASA work was done with CASA and Intel in the Curio lab and done as a proof of concept that was then shared through webinars publicly and at the cable show. Um, we're bringing in some other vendors to look at you know, different layers of the stack. So Curio is just kind of how we're operationalizing this and how we're able to, to do specific vendor focused things. So we you know, run, open, run Snaps OpenStack or run a different version of OpenStack and then load the VNFs and then connect it to cable-y things, you know, like connect it to an RPD or connect it to a DOCSIS network. And it you know, sits right in our lobby, so we get a lot of great traffic with our members as well. Thank you, Dan. Right. Other questions? Right. I, I had a couple. I mean, right. one is the, the SNAPS activity. I mean, just yeah. for everybody else may be as ignorant as I am, but 
you know, how long has it been going, number one, and like what is the final output going to look like, and you know, how do the cable companies or anybody in the community consume that? Right, that's a great question. So, so two questions. One is how long is the snap <laughs> activity, and, and what is the output, and how does it get consumed? Yeah. So we've been doing virtualization at Cable Labs for I think four or five years. I've been there for three and a half years. Um, the snaps term came up I think two and a half years ago when I was flying to our winter conference and I was sick of saying SCN and NFE. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where the term came from. It's become kind of our, our badge and our umbrella term for all of our activity we're doing in the SDN and NFE space. Um, you know, how will members consume it? Well, one is you know, standing it up in their labs to do POCs. Um, another is we're looking at, you know, how can we define something, you know, and looking at what Cord's done and some other, you know, some of the other work that's been done on the telecom side to virtualize our access network and what more can we do to standardize that, you know, that way when members, when vendors create a virtualized CCAP core, they know what to expect and we'll have more interoperability there. Um, so we're seeing that and also using it to, you know, just better define our standards. You know, some of the stuff went into our virtual provisioning interface, if you guys are familiar with that, the VPI, um, which allows for dynamically provisioning a cable modem. So you can do, you know, increase the speed, decrease the speed, make changes without rebooting your cable modem and doing, downloading the config file. Um, and that, again, we brought in the SDN controller into that architecture to see how that would go as part of the reference. And so we're really kind of really trying to drive that with a focus starting really on the access network, which is where our roots are and where we have a, you know, billions and billions of dollars in assets. Sure. And then, I mean, for example, the architecture that we have here is the end goal that it would evolve to a point where with minor modifications it can be, you know, taken by the different cable labs, cable members, and maybe even others, and just kind of instantiated within their networks once they, you know, once they're moving in that direction. Exactly. So anyone can use it today for lab and development proof of concepts. You know, for production, yes, yeah, someone could invest the time and take this as a base for a production solution. Um, or go with a vendor-based one where you get a faster time to market. You know, that's kind of one of those decisions that, you know, sure. all of our mid-tier operators will not be rolling their own, but larger operators, they may roll their own, and some already have rolled their own open stack distributions. Um, so, yeah, so again, this is a starting point that could be used there, but really it's kind of driving the common denominator with, you know, having a pure open source solution upstream, so it's what the distributions will be picking up within a year. So when you go and get, get it from your commercial vendor, you can get that. All right, any other, any other questions from the audience? And then the last one is, uh, you know, is SNAPS looking for any kind of contribution or inputs from the community itself, and yes. what are those? Great question, yeah. So yes, actually if you go to our GitHub pages, um, it's, we have issues, if you have a bug, post it, and then some of the issues, if, um, if you look, are actually you know, looking for contribution and good first issues. So some of the minor bugs, we've actually left them out there so that someone who wants to learn how to do open source or engage in the community can do that. And we really do want this to be a self-sustaining community. And with um, Snapso as part of OPNFE, um, there's a lot of great engagement in that already, and we're happy to have more people um, either write more tests with it or use it. And if you have a specific use case that isn't covered, um, we add them fairly quickly. Most of the new feature requests for the Fraser release of OPNFE were done within a couple of days for each feature, so we can roll those out fairly fast. Okay. Cool. All right, so any, any questions? Wonderful, thanks so much, Randy, oh, appreciate it.